Yes, unfortunately for worldwide socialism, you're listening to the hour of the time. I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, it's apparent that throughout the United States, people have forgotten many things. And, of course, many of you never knew these things to begin with. And so... You don't know. But after listening to this broadcast tonight, you will have no excuse. Those of you who have forgotten will remember. And those of you who have never known will discover. Listen carefully, ladies and gentlemen. For tonight, I take you back, back in time... And we will tonight remember. Dragnet, their job to enforce the law and preserve the safety of decent citizens. Decent citizens.
city of Phoenix, ladies and gentlemen, is training National Guardsmen. Training National Guardsmen to perform police duties on bicycles in neighborhoods in Phoenix in violation of the Posse Comitatus laws. Unconstitutional, illegal, the police state is here. I can conceive of a national destiny which meets the responsibilities of today's and measures up to the possibilities of tomorrow. Behold a republic resting securely upon the mountain of eternal truth. A republic applying in practice and proclaiming to the world the self-evident proposition that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with inalienable rights, that governments are instituted among men to secure these rights, and that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Behold a republic in which civil and religious liberty stimulate all to earnest endeavor, and in which the law restrains every hand uplifted for a neighbor's injury. A republic in which every citizen is a sovereign, but in which no one cares to wear a crown. Behold a republic standing erect while empires all around are bowed beneath the weight of their own armament. A republic whose flag is love, while other flags are only fear. The whole a republic, increasing in population, in wealth, in strength, and in influence, solving the problems of civilization, and facing the coming of a universal brotherhood. A republic which shakes thrones and dissolves aristocracies by its silent example and gives light and inspiration to those who sit in darkness. Behold a republic, gradually but surely becoming the supreme moral factor in the world's progress and the accepted arbiter of the world's dispute. A republic whose history, like the path of the just, is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. A man named... A man named Orwell wrote a book called 1984. 1984, ladies and gentlemen, he was only 10 years off. Only 10 years off. A man named H.G. Wells in 1940 wrote a book called The New World Order. A man named George Bush said, Our fifth goal in the Middle East is a new world order. I 
Communist Manifesto, written by Karl Marx, has been implemented in the United States of America. In fact, there is not one single plank of the Communist Manifesto that is not 100% in effect today. There was a man who sat in the United Nations and pounded his shoe upon his desk, and he said, We will bury you. The Illuminati many years ago instituted two great experiments. One is known as the United States of America. The other one was known as the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union branched and communism reigned in China. Khrushchev said, we will not have to invade you with an army. You will be destroyed from within. Joseph McCarthy was right. The confrontation was not created by the police. The confrontation was pre created by the people who charged the police. Gentlemen, get the thing straight once and for all. The policeman isn't there to create disorder. The policeman is there to preserve disorder. The policeman is there to preserve disorder. You heard it, ladies and gentlemen, from Mayor of Chicago. That was, of course, the mayor of Chicago talking about the riots at the Democratic Convention where peaceful demonstrators' heads were broken open because they disagreed with those in power. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not
This is not our government. This government is full of traitors and is committing treason on a daily basis. There used to be a requirement that all government workers take an oath of allegiance to the Constitution of the United States of America. After Joseph McCarthy was vilified by the press and after he was driven from Congress in ruins, that oath was thrown in the trash can. There are some dark pages in the history of the white man's dealings with the Indian, and many parts of the record that stain with the greed and avarice of those who have thought only of their own profit. But it is also true that the purposes and motives of this great government and of our nation as a whole, so as the red men, have been wise, just, and beneficent. The remarkable progress of our Indian brothers towards civilization is proof of it and open to all to see. During the past half century, you have seen the schoolhouse take the place of the military post on your reservation. The administration of Indian affairs has been transferred 
from the military to the civil arm of the government. The education and industrial training the government has given you has enabled thousands of Indian men and women to take their places in civilization alongside their white neighbors. Thousands are living in substantial farmhouses on their own separate allotments of land. Hundreds of others have won places of prominence in the professions, and some have worked their way into the halls of Congress and into places of responsibility in our state and national government. 30,000 Indian children are enrolled in government state and mission schools. The great white father now calls you his brothers, not his children. Because you have shown in your education and in your settled ways of life, kind, manly, worthy qualities of sound character. If you're an American Indian, stand with us. You know the lies. You have lived with the lies throughout your history in dealing with this government. They gave you the worst lands to live on and told you that you would be sovereign nations in your treaties. And they broke treaty after treaty after treaty. And then when they found out that the worthless, terrible land that they gave you held the greatest amount of natural resources that can be found in this country, they then began plotting to take the land back away from you. And they've used you for medical experiments and for experimentation with biological warfare agents throughout the years. To arms, form your militias. Stand with us for freedom. We march from the streets and country, from the roads and the hills and the vales, where every young boy is dead and the rusty gear for sale. Our country will not fight again. Our state is not for yours. The battle of prosperity has never come to us. Tell us to our great winter hill and spotty pie. For the village is dead and the leaves set to your side. So we think our spirit is broken because we are under experiments in the Soviet Union, the seed of democracy was planted in the mind of the intellectual in the United States of America. 
the oppressive heel of capitalism planted the seed of communism in the American worker. You don't remember, do you? You don't remember these songs of the Communist Party in America, do you? Senator Joseph McCarthy remembered, heard them in his youth. He knew what was happening, and so do I. And you had better learn pretty damn quick. I have tried to educate. If I have not succeeded altogether, I have certainly educated myself about these questions and also about these wonderful human beings that are American. Just remember who you are. You are American. Your forebears found a wilderness and they began to convert it into a fair land with only three weapons, with the Bible, the axe, and the plow. Nothing saved them, neither the perils of death, nor wounds, nor savage mountains, nor wide rivers, nor the unknown into which they plunged. They were of every racial stock and every religious faith, and each brought something of the old country to the new country. And different though they were, they became one. This is our heritage, and this is our true glory. We are a people, I tell you, that is just beginning its high adventure on this continent. It is an adventure in which, young though we are, we have done this. Our people have had more happiness and prosperity over a wider area for a longer time than men have ever had since they began to live in ordered societies 4,000 years ago. Since we have come so far, who shall be rash enough to set limits on our future progress? Who shall say that since we have gone so far, we can go no farther? Who shall say that the American dream is ended? For myself, I believe that all we have done upon this continent is but a prelude to a future in which we shall become not only a bigger people, but also a wiser people, a better people, an even greater people. I believe that we shall achieve not only a higher standard of living, but also a higher standard of life. Never forget this. There is little we Americans cannot do if only we can imagine ourselves wanting to do. Power alone is not enough, nor is faith alone equal to the task. The future is to those who take it. We shall strike off the shackles that still bind the United States. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. The life or death issue of war or peace hangs upon it. We are 155 million strong. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. We are free striding people with a confident, free swinging stride that marks the American everywhere he goes upon this earth. We are conquerors of time and of distance. We have explored the awful jungles of matter and emerged with the powers of the exploding sun. Our cause is just. Our heart is hard. And let us then, I say, press forward toward the new world that we can create in the name of America and of suffering humanity still in chains. Now you say words, beautiful words. But how, how do we do all of this with a staggering budget of heavy, heavy taxes surrounded by the communist menace and enfeebled Europe, Asia in ferment, our boys in war, training for war? Well, I say that nothing is easy. And the best things are the hardest. But consider what it was done at, ba at Valley Forge. What was done in the dark days of dissension and disaster. In the Civil War. In the two world wars. When the very survival of Western civilization trembled. And in the Depression. There is nothing new. Only different. And all our troubles. All our immense difficulties. Now and in the future. Can I say be solved if we have the will. The courage. The boldness to face it face them square. To use Seneca's phrase, man is more than a rational animal. And invoking the guidance of providence, rational man, animated by the destiny of greatness, can think and can act and can do greatly. Thank you. Freedom for men and women to live free in this world requires constant vigilance. 
constant vigilance and great, great personal sacrifice. If freedom was worth this vigilance and this sacrifice for our forefathers and all those who have laid down their lives for this country, what is wrong with you? That the luxury we can't afford For they don't approve of love on the door On the unemployed assistant board We've no room of our own There's nothing but the benches in the park Where we can sit alone and hold our hands and whisper in the dark. We can't do the things that other lovers do, and it's There's not much sense in life. But it seems funny romance. Though we love each other, body and soul, in our hearts we know we haven't a chance, for there's no such thing as... Love on the door, that's a luxury we can't afford. For they don't approve of love on the door, on the unemployed of distant force. Room of our room, there's nothing but the benches in the park. Where we can sit alone and hold our hands and whisper in the dark. We can do the things that other lovers do, and it's hard to live on nothing but dreams. When a thing to dream can never come true, there's not much sense in life for us, it seems. Only romance, so we love each other, body and soul. In our hearts we know we haven't a chance, for there's no such thing as love on the road. Love on the They're wrong, folks. When the communists wrote and sang that song in the streets of America, there was no such thing as love on the dole until they created the welfare state. And the welfare state was created in such a way that it became profitable to make love on the dole for with each illegitimate child born, there was more money in the paycheck. Now, I don't seek the presidency to strip this nation of its defenses or to abandon the cause of freedom around the world. I seek the presidency so that this nation will be strong enough to deter war and determined enough to encourage freedom. I ask your help and the help of all Americans so that an American president can tell Nikita Khrushchev, you are wrong. Our children will not live under communism. Your children will live under freedom. I ask your help in this crusade to restore pride at home and respect abroad. And this is why I say that Republicans must take off the gloves 
This is why I say that this election is not one for the record books. This election is one for the history books. Americans have plenty tonight to be mad about, and Republicans have plenty to talk about. Let's... Let's get on with the job of winning this election. We'll never have a better chance, and we'll never face a clearer choice. Thank you. Well, is that the way it went? Is that the way it's supposed to go? What in the world has happened to this great nation and why are you sitting on your butts doing nothing about it? Have you all forgotten? If you have, tonight is the night to remember. Ladies and gentlemen, this war in which we're now engaged is not, cannot be, a war between America's two great political parties. As I've often said in the past, certainly the millions of loyal Americans have long voted the Democrat ticket. Love America just as much. They hate communism just as much as the average republic. I'm not going to discuss politics tonight. I am going to discuss this war in which we've been engaged for 105 years. A war declared by Karl Marx in 1848, redeclared and brought down to date by Lenin, again redeclared by Stalin. And again, redeclared by the Kremlin within the last five or six weeks. Keep in mind also, my good friends, that as of tonight, we are not winning this war. Keep in mind that 106 years ago, when this war was declared, you could number the active communists on the fingers of both your hands. 97 years later, in 1945, you couldn't number them on the fingers of both your hands. The number then was 180 million human souls. As of tonight, the 17th day of March, 1954, just eight years later, the figure is not 180 million. As of tonight, the figure is 800 million people. 800 million people in communist slavery. My good friends, no brutalitarian force has ever achieved that success before in the history of this world. Christianity in 2,000 years has not been that successful. So let's keep in mind, my good friends, that this is something not far from you, the people in this audience here tonight. Now, let's get down, if we may, to what we're doing about it today, as you know, some of us in Washington have been sent down there, men like that grand old man of the Senate, the great Democrat Pat McCarran, men like Bill Jenner and others have been trying to slowly dig out, to expose to the public view those who would destroy this nation. Now you will see, you are seeing today. An all-out attempt to marshal the forces of the opposition, using not merely the communists, other fellow travelers, the new liberals, the eggheads, and some of my good friends in both the Democrat and Republican parties, who can become heroes overnight in the eyes of the left-wing press, if they will join in the join with the jackal pack. What you will find is the all-out attempt to try and curb the powers of the investigating committee. Change the rules, if you please. Make it tougher to investigate communists than it is to expose crooks and dishonest. When you hear, when you hear this time, or as you're hearing it today, ask yourself this question. Why, why should it be more difficult? Why should it be made more difficult? Why should the rules be different? in exposing treason, in exposing truckers. I would like to tonight, if you don't mind, 
I'd like to give you the names of some of the individuals who have appeared before our one-man committee. And keep in mind, when you talk about a one-man committee, that as far as my committee is concerned, we have never, we've never held a single hearing which is objected to by a single senator on the committee. I would like to just pick at random the names of 20, if I may. And let me tell you what happened to those 20. All of them, by the time they appeared before our committee, by the time they were subpoenaed, by the time they were ordered to appear, they were either working for the government or they were working in defense plants which were handling secret and top secret work. All of them, after they appeared before the committee, were either fired or suspended. Let's run through the names. W. Call, Robert Goodwin, Edward Rothschild, Nathaniel Mills, Henry Archdeacon, Donald Morrill, Whittelog, Pierre Persky, R. Levine, Alexander Gregory, Theodore Pappas, Victor Bullies, Irving Perez, that name I imagine is familiar, Sidney Friedlander, Robert Northrop, Arthur Owens, Joseph Gebhardt, Emmanuel Fernandez, Gordon Belgrave, Dewey Bashir, Leo Kentrowitz. I just picked those at random, my good friends, to give you an idea of the some of the people who would still be in government tonight or in defense plants if the left wingers had their way, as they could not have been dug out before the so called one man men. I would like to read to you very briefly from a document, and you try and guess what this is as I read from it, would you? You can try and guess what this is reading from. Uh, page 15. So we must, we must take part in any fights between Eisenhower and McCarthy. I'm not quoting this verbatim, I'm paraphrasing it, it's too long to read. We have been derelict in our duty in not having taken part in those fights. Now I quote verbatim. Uh, we must direct the sharpest fire on any given issue against McCarthy, but we must be careful not to appear to support Eisenhower either. In other words, you get the idea? We must enter the fight. We must damn hell on McCarthy and be careful don't pray late. In other words, they don't like Ike either. Then, then they define the, the method, the method of the fight against the committee's digging out communists. They say, refer to it as a struggle against witch hunting investigations of the McCarthy McCarran type of congressional committee. Defend the victims of McCarthyism. Then, in addition, there is the important direct attack upon McCarthy himself. And then they give the three aims the three aims, one of the three aims that they quote to elect an anti McCarthy Congress by defeating every McCarthy McCarranite candidate, especially singling out for defeat those who are incumbents, and by electing a powerful block of conscious and determined fighters against McCarthyism. See, they're very nonpartisan. They'd say defeat the McCarran type of Democrat, the McCarthy type of Republican. Who do you think has said this? September 1953, the main report delivered at the National Conference of the Communist Party of the United States of America. That's the party line. Who set this party line? According to this communist booklet, it's Mr. Andrew Stevens. Well, I would like to tell you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that there is no Andrew Stevens. There is no Andrew Stevens. And I would like to challenge that communist party, which sets down the line to be followed by all communists throughout the United States. I would like to challenge them to tell us who the secret communist is, who is so high in the party that he can set the line for the National Conference of the Communist Party, 1953. Of course, they won't do that. I might say the American people would be very, very much surprised, I'm sure, if you knew the identity of Andrew Stevens. There's only one communist party. The communist party that puts out this pamphlet setting the line for the communist the United States is the same communist party as the one that tells Fifth Amendment communists how they should testify. It's the same communist party, if you please, that ordered American boys 
have their hands wired behind their backs and their brains blown out with communist machine guns. It's one and the same party, my good friend. Now, there are those who say, well, it's all right to dig them out. But, oh, we don't like you men. Well, my good friends, up to this day, up to this very moment, none of the those who have said they don't like the methods have told us any other method they could use that would be effective. And when you hear them crying that they don't like the method, I suggest that you ask them when and where they ever exposed the communists by their methods. They say, when they say, you don't treat them like gentlemen, I'd like to ask them, take the 20, the 20 whom I've named you. If they don't give us general statements, my good friend, they pick out one of those cases and tell us whether we ever mistreated any of those innocent communists. You know, it's so easy to make those general statements. And when they say you don't treat them like gentlemen, while well, we do, I might say that if we, if we did not, I would not cry for them. Traitors are not gentlemen, my good friends. They don't understand being treated like that. <laughs> May I say to you, my good friends, tonight, to the American people, I don't care. I don't give a tinker's day. <laughs> how high or how low, how high or how low, People in either the Republican or Democrat party, either party, are unhappy about our methods. This fight is going to go on as long as I am in the United States, sir. I've often been asked by some of my friends why, why I continue this contest when at times the odds seem very high against you. About 20 years ago, it was more than that. 25 years ago, I was a chicken farmer back in Wisconsin. Since then, I have been given, I think, the highest honor that the people of the nation can give any man, namely the job of representing them in the United States Senate. This nation, this country has been very good to me. I am extremely lucky also in that I have a wife who is interested in this fight and is willing to take all these new thoughts. And I may say that the only way that I can repay my nation, the only way that I can keep faith with the people who have given me that high honor of manning the watchtowers of this nation, is to continue this fight, regardless of how deep the scars may be, regardless of how rough the fight may get. I know, I know that you, the members of the Irish Fellowship Club of Chicago, will believe me when I tell you that this fight is not going to stop. The fight did not stop. Joseph McCarthy gave his all. We let him down because we believed the left-wing socialist-controlled press. I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, with utmost certainty, that the intellectuals in the old Soviet Union who longed for democracy will not get it. And the communists in the United States who long for communism will not get that either. For it has always been intended that Hegel's principle of political conflict resolution will bring out a synthesis of the two, which will result in one world totalitarian Marxist socialism. Don't believe it? Stick around. <laughs>
understand the words to that song, ladies and gentlemen. You've forgotten. Ask a Russian. Ask a Russian. They'll be happy to tell you what the words mean. Do it quick, though, because soon you won't be able to ask questions anymore about anything. These United States are confronted with an economic affliction of great proportions. We suffer from the longest and one of the worst sustained inflations in our national history. It distorts our economic decisions, penalizes thrift, and crushes the struggling young and the fixed income elderly alike. It threatens to shatter the lives of millions of our people. Idle industries have cast workers into unemployment, human misery, and personal indignity. Those who do work are denied a fair return for their labor by a tax system which penalizes successful achievement and keeps us from maintaining full productivity. But great as our tax burden is, it has not kept pace with public spending. For decades, we have piled deficit upon deficit, mortgaging our future and our children's future for the temporary convenience of the present. To continue this long trend is to guarantee tremendous social, cultural, political, and economic upheavals. You and I, as individuals, can, by borrowing, live beyond our means, but for only a limited period of time. Why, then, should we think that collectively, as a nation, we're not bound by that same limitation? We must act today in order to preserve tomorrow. And let there be no misunderstandings. We're going to begin to act beginning today. The economic ills we suffer have come upon us over several decades. They will not go away in days, weeks, or months, but they will go away. They will go away because we, as Americans, have the capacity now, as we've had in the past, to do whatever needs to be done to preserve this last and greatest bastion of freedom. In this present crisis, Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. In the greatest acting role of his life, Ronald Reagan told the truth to get elected. And then, during his eight years in office, did everything in his power to increase the size of government. And he spent so much money that he put us in debt that we will never recover from. Ronald Reagan, in his eight years in office, spent more money in those eight years than the entire United States government had ever spent collectively in its entire history. Ronald Reagan was also a liar. Now I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you had better wake up, and you had better wake up quick. You had better arm yourselves while you can still find arms and ammunition. You had better form militia units, and you had better get ready to fight. There was a lieutenant in the Maricopa County Jail. Upon my release, he told me he would be there waiting for when they brought me back. My message to him is Lieutenant Dean. The only way that I will come back to the Maricopa County Jail is to free another patriot. Listen to this song, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't wake up and if you're not prepared to fight for your liberty, you had better learn the words because you'll be singing it soon. Bye. 
Yeah. <laughs> 